Robbie coming on this show with these shirts and be cooking me, man. I'm like, yo, I gotta, I gotta step my game up. I gotta, I gotta do something. No, so. my, my, my wife, <laughs> my wife actually, my wife actually made this uh, oh. a couple years ago. Bro, I'm so glad you did that. Look, I got something for the show in June. Let me find this. Let me find this. Oh goodness, I'm so glad you did that. Yo, when I find it, I'm gonna show it to you. I'm pretty excited about it. I ordered a shirt um, that I'm going to wear. Do you know the Three and Three Life brand and uh, Mr. Gus Weaver? No, no, I haven't heard of him. Yeah, he. Um, they're doing these Juneteenth shirts, man. And I ordered oh, one from him. Yeah, they're one of the sponsors of Pistons as well. I, I really like what they're doing. I like what he and his wife are about. I like what he's about in this uh, kind of basketball community. Is he's he? going to be helping Wilbur Pistons out as well. He's going to be helping us out with some things, our basketball league that we have coming to the forefront. But this man, if you know basketball and AAU, he's kind of been all over the map here. And uh, it, it was kind of awesome. He hit me up. I was like, dude, I got to cop that. I was going to surprise you. But I was like, man, bro, I got the shirt. Let me just show it to him now. <laughs> so, yeah, mine is already here. I got it in the mail. It's pretty dope. Let me see yours again. You said your wife made that one? Yep. That's fire, man. I'm going to have to get one of those to wear on the shirt as well. Oh, well, wear on the show as well. Now, now my, uh, my, uh, bless you boys, Tiger shirt. Oh, that's fire. I like it, that's fire it, too. Don't, don't undersell that one. <laughs> I, I had, uh, I was like, man, let me try and uh, bring some on the show today. The Tigers, you know, they were in second place in the central for a while now in third. You know, hey, you know what? I'll take it. It's a little bit better than we thought they were going to be. And see, here's, uh, the, here's, like, here's the thing with them. They just have to be fun to watch. I don't, I don't need you to win every game. Right. You win two, three times a week. I'm okay with that because I can sit down and watch it. It's watchable baseball. And that's, that's not a, that's not a very high bar, but it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what, man, let's get into this. Let's get into this. It's been some news in the Pistons world. I'm going to be able to talk about it. The coaching search, you know, Jade and Ivy, Jalen Duran and the, you know, all rookie team. I'm thankful for the therapy that the legend has provided over these coming weeks and you know, months and things, so we could be prepared for what we saw. And actually, I think it's a mixed bag. But we're going to get into this. We're going to get into it. And I want to start to reveal our Woodward Pistons big board. I'm going to share mine. I hope you have yours ready, Rod. And we're going to get just. Why do Why board. do you even need a big board? It's <laughs> one player. It's It's one player. That's the big board. It's It's the, not even a board it's like one big one big line of just Vic the only question is whether you can get Wimbanyama on the whole line that's the only question that's that's the issue that we have like, is that we're hoping on the jersey right how's it gonna fit on a headline that we we've already had that discussion of like can we just call him Wimby is that okay is it is Vic good enough we gotta figure something out because Wimbanyama is not gonna fit on head it's not gonna go in the paper very well, and it's not gonna be on on uh, our online stories very well either. We got to figure something out. Oh man, Victor Wimbanyama, I am I am so happy for this draft season, man. I'm, I'm so happy for the lottery coming up. This has been like a fun time for us for a while, but let's get this drum roll started. Let's get the intro going. What up, though, people? It's your boy, Brandon Dent, a.k.a. Detroit Kool-Aid, and you're rocking out with the Woodward Pistons podcast. Jeff Fire Freddy, already on the morning Woodward. We're going to get some other content in when we can. He can't wait as well to talk to you all about a lot of different things. But first, let's get this drum roll going for the legend. Hey, yo, shout out to the legend, Detroit News Rod Beard, brother, as always. Welcome, and how are you doing? I am awesome. Six <laughs> six days from Victor Day. Victory is gonna be our day. And oh. I already I already used that. That's that's our headline when they win the lottery. Victory. <laughs> Victor hyphen Y. That's it. That's it. M Rod Bear. That's Listen. it. R write it down. He's been dropping bars. He's been dropping like these phrases for a while that honestly should hang in the rafters of Detroit sports like history. You know, the sick for Vic one, come on. That one was that one was pretty official. Those were bars. You know, I I, I still I, I'm I'm holding out hope. I got the, the wood over here, so I'm knocking on it. So, uh, you know, all of our viewers and, and whatnot, they think that we're going to jinx this thing. And, and we, they got a bone to pick with us, too, bro. <laughs> next <laughs> next week on the show, it's just going to be and we're going to get shirts made. It's just going to be 
Uh, well for Vic. We're we're well for Vic. We're not even sick for Vic anymore. We're gonna be well, well for, for Vic. Vic. Let's go. Let's rock. Now, and you know what? Just real quick before we get into the coaching search, man. People said people are saying that for some reason we willed, we purposed this Dylan Brooks thing into existence. After the show, I I could, bro, when I saw your tweet, when I saw a report from Mark Stein, I was like, what? What? Dylan Brooks. So I'm glad we covered it. I'm glad we talked about what it would realistically look like, what you would do. We tried. We said we were going to be pros about this thing. But see, that's that's what we do. We get out in front of stuff before it happens so people understand when the conversation happens afterward. We didn't just conjure this up. I, this is real. This is a real thought that has to go on and what you do with Dylan Brooks. I mean... We get a few of these right. Every once in a while, we get one of these right. Every once in a while. I'm hoping that no one goes and digs up the ones we got wrong. I have some oh, they, they, they know. They know. They, 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 man. <laughs> they, put them, they put them in a little receipt pile, and they just put them over here and stash them. You know how, I'm not going to say black people, but you know how people put the little shopping bags after you go, and then you just put them in a, in, it, they're either under the sink or they're in another drawer. That's where all the receipts are. For all of the stuff that we got wrong, so that someday they're just gonna pull them out and just. Bro, why are you talking about my two piles I got at the crib right now? I got one in a special little cabinet, and the other one, we got this big old Coles bag, bro. I don't even know the last time we went to Coles, but it was huge. I think it's from my grandmother, bro. <laughs> like seriously, it's, and it's all bags, all bags, bags in, bag. in bags, yeah. bags in bags. <laughs> if you need any kind of bag, if I'm yeah, running bro, late and I need to. Bags. <laughs> I need to put my lunch in something. Hey, let me grab one of these. Let me grab and, and let's go. What you got? A couple of things. Put it in there. Goodness. I'm, we... I'm glad you addressed that. <laughs> <laughs> bags and bags. Oh, man. Let's get into the business. The coaching search. How you doing, Jeff? Water bottle Jeff today. Oh, it's water bottle Jeff. Okay. All right. Water I got bottle you. Jeff today. But the coaching search, man, the three finalists, it's been announced that they will meet with Tom Gores. This was confirmed as well by friend of the show, uh, Mike Curtis of the Detroit News, Pistons beat writer. Um, and and let, let, me, let me do this first. Let me do this first. Yeah. They are three of the finalists. The It like could that. be one of those three, and it could be none of those three. So they are three finalists. They are not the only finalists. Dude. So in these in these meetings this week, they could say uh, they could they could knock Tom Gores' socks off, and he could hire one of them. Or Gores could say, you know what, I don't like any of these guys. Bring me more guys. So that was a very specific thing that um, that I heard. In, in the process that, that this is going on, it's not automatically one of these three people. It could be somebody completely different. Mm. So don't feel like it has to be one of these three. It could be none of the above. Heat. Heat, man. Wait, Rod, you starting off the show with heat. The Pistons have been so subtle, but very precise with their wording, man. And it makes huge differences when you're talking about covering this team. And, and trying to figure out what are they what are they going to do? What are they about? You know, you told me this early on. You told Jeff this early on. Listen to what they're saying. Read mm -hmm. what they're writing. Read the quotes. You know, and, and being able to have kind of this perspective on the beat, it's kind of made it even uh, a, a lot easier time to process because you're hearing it right from the horse's mouth. And to mm -hmm. be able to kind of pull out that nuance within this coaching search, you know, that's crucial. You know, I, I like that Tom Gores is meeting with them directly. I don't know necessarily what goes into what the owner's looking for, you know, as it relates to these coaching searches. But obviously, they've passed the threshold of Troy Weaver. And if you trust in Troy, you trust in Troy. Now, obviously, there's one candidate here. I was going to ask who's your favorite. But I kind of want to start with just your thoughts on Kevin Ali. There's a lot of people who believe this man should not even be a candidate right now. When I kind of did some digging around and such, you know, obviously, there are some people who will discount the UConn run, but you have to also give it some credence as well. A coach in the trenches of a championship run, I don't care, with basketball especially, I don't care whose players you did it with, man, that is a feat. That is a feat, right. and that deserves yeah. to be a feather in his cap. I'm not taking away a championship from that man. 
I'm not doing that. Uh, and I'm not going to discount that either. Uh, I get uh, the things that happened around the Yukon and his exit and all of that. And based on, and Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, based on the findings later, he was found to not be in a uh, wrong light or a bad light in that yep. situation and actually won his judgment. Yep, so, that's the understanding I have too. Right. And so people, they continue to say, well, where was he at? Well, when you're in the middle of this type of litigation, you're not going to be anywhere in coaching. It's going to be very, very exactly. tough to find something. So exactly. that cuts off his ability to have this kind of pro track record after mm-hmm. this kind of good run at UConn that kind of tailored off a little bit. We'll be fair to that. We will be fair to that. But I, I get what was going on. With this kind of overtime elite um, experience that he's gotten, it's been as head of coaching and player development. So I don't know mm-hmm. how much direct coaching he's doing over you know X's and O's, but as it relates to being head of player development, and being in the trenches with these kids, relating with them, helping them develop, and seeing these guys go from, you know, hopeful prospects to NBA lottery prospects, this is being done at his helm. And so I wanted to be able to get your thoughts on it after kind of prefacing it. And then uh, after that, maybe, you know, who's your favorite of this bunch? Yeah, I I think all of that stuff goes into it. And you mentioned kind of the player development piece. And obviously we know that's something that is um, important to Troy Weaver and important to, Uh, Dwayne Casey, too, in just this roster and the young players that they have, you want to be able to develop them. You want to be able to um, continue what they've done. And it is we talked about internal improvement. That's been the catchphrase for about the past four, five, six years. Internal improvement, because you can't always go out in the drafting and get the guy you want. You can't always go in free agency. Sometimes you just got to go and get yourself better. And you can see that, that that's part of what he brings to the table. The issue I have is you want somebody who understands if you if you went a Kevin Alley route, you've got to surround him with assistants who have a ton of NBA experience. So that's mm-hmm. the only question I have there is if he doesn't have NBA experience, where is that coming from on the rest of his staff? And we've seen that with um, Dwayne Casey. Initially, he had um, his his first as- group of assistants with Tim Hardaway and all of those guys, they had a ton of NBA experience, both as players and as assistant coaches I like that um, stuff. that were around him. And then when they moved into a player development role, when they were doing the rebuild, then it turned in. We need a whole new staff and we need a, a, all different people because our focus is different. So, again, I, I think that's the thing. If you're looking at Kevin Ali is what what is that um, group of assistants around him look like? So my favorite in all of these. I'm going to say for now is Charles Lee because he comes from Milwaukee. He comes from a winning culture and there's a focus on defense with um, coach Bud. And and if he brings some of that with him, younger coach, I think he's 38, that energy that a young guy, and we're seeing that with Joe Mazzula in Boston is you get a young guy who has the ear and the young players can tap into that. I think that's very, very valuable. And if you're saying this is a guy who's going to be our guy for 10 years, 12 years, we're really investing in him and we believe in him. Not that you sign him to a 10 or 12 year contract, but you just feel like he can be the answer for you and you don't have to go out in another four or five years and bring in another young guy. So if, if, if yeah. Charles Lee is, is exactly what you think he is and he turns into that, you're set for coaching for, for, as long as you've got this group of players, as long as Cade is around Ivy and Duran, you have your coach if you get this one right. So I think that's what I like about Charles Lee. And and Jerron Collins, same sort of thing. He's been around Golden State. He's been around a winning culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and you bring that. So that's what I like about kind of this group of, of, of three that they have so far as they bring different things. But the winning atmosphere, um, I don't know what what – Collins or Lee can do as the front guy, as the front man. They've been the background assistant. What do you do when you're in that first chair and you're drawing up the plays and you're making all the big decisions? And to a degree, you don't really have to. And people have said this. Why don't they have a a big name head coach among these people that they're interviewing? Because you got Dwayne Casey right there. He's not going to be on the bench and coaching with you, but in practices, you don't think he's going to give you some tips. You don't think he's going to have a voice in some of those things. Um, so I, I think that's he said he would. He says he's not going to override and overrule the coach. He would still be exactly. a, a, yeah, an asset. Exactly. So so that's why I don't think you have to look at a lot of these retreads uh, coaches who have been around. Now, Budenholzer, I would I would 
kind of kick the tires on it, kind of see. Nick Nurse. Yeah, well, not Nick Nurse. I, I think there is a negative zero chance that Nick Nurse is even on a list and gets a phone call. Negative zero. But for many reasons. <laughs> for 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 several reasons. For but front office reason right now. I feel you. I mean, I mean let me step aside. <laughs> what did what did what did Nick Nurse really do? Really do. Because if you tell me you inherit a roster, you inherited a roster that that was good, that was built up when you were an assistant, you bring in Kawhi, and it happens to be the year that LeBron is injured, and you had some success with that team. Okay. All right. I mean, I'm not saying anybody would win a championship with that, but I'm saying Dwayne Casey would have won a championship with that team, too. And so um, in the year since, in the year since, has they have they had that same level of success? No. Mm -hmm. So is Nick Nurse this genius that he's very often made out to be? Nick Nurse is not Mike Budenholzer. Let's not like I've been trying to tell people that let's not conflate this. I'm not going to take away from Nick Nurse the fact that he won a championship. I will wait it. But for the people who are anti Kevin Ali, I don't understand the infatuation with Nick Nurse. I don't. It's, that that one is odd to me. But Mike Budenholzer, that's one that you know we we've talked about coaches like him. Uh, and those guys that just every time they kind of play the the Pistons, they just kind of boat race them. You know, the Knicks or another team like that. Uh, you know, and their whole coaching tree. It's it's. I don't know. I like Budenholzer. I like what you said about Charles Lee and the thing that you said that I've been kind of waffling between him and Jaron Collins because I like the coaches that Jaron Collins has been under too. I mean, I I told this to Sean and Jeff and the guys. It, you know, shout out Sean Murphy from Half Court. Uh, if it, I could pluck one head coach right now it would be Willie Green. If I could just go and kind of get a favorite, just kind of just a personal mm-hmm. bias. I like Willie Green a lot, man. I liked him as a player. I liked mm-hmm. the professionalism. I liked what he brought to the court. I like how even as a young guy, you can see him teaching other people. I'm talking about like as a player, you know, I loved his UDM days. You know, I just, I don't know. I liked him. He was the person who kind of drew my attention there. And then Rashad Phillips was the one who kind of like I really loved UDM, U- Detroit Mercy basketball because of those types of players. And let me let me let me tell you how old I am. Yeah, I covered Willie Green when he played at Cooley, and he was a monster. He could score the rock. He was incredible. He was one of the best awesome. like players out of Detroit that I've ever covered. That dude was 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 a scorer, and so. I like that last <laughs> that last season on the beat um, when we went to New Orleans um, after the pregame, um, I pulled him to the side and was like, "Hey man, you, you don't even remember me because this is legit twenty five years ago." <laughs> but I covered you at Cooley, and we sat there and just chopped it up about Cooley. That man, he he was a monster, but he he was really good about it. And we just sat and chopped it up for a minute. But he's, I think that's where you're looking in terms of, uh, and that's why I like Charles Lee again. Young guy, give him his opportunity. And um, if you get it right, again, that's your guy for 10, 12 years. You don't have to worry about going back and touching that whatsoever. If you get it right, that's the that's the only caveat with this is you have to get it right. And he has to be your guy. And uh, the, the issue there is Milwaukee's looking for a coach, too. And why wouldn't he take the Milwaukee job? The, the question there, they got enough free agents. I think Lopez is a free agent. Um, Chris Middleton's a free agent. If you feel like enough of those guys are leaving, and, and Giannis isn't going anywhere. That's that you, you can rebuild around Giannis very, very easily. But if you look at this job and you say, there's stability here, how many more years does Giannis have left? And if you look at this roster and say, it isn't now, but in, in four or five years, could this be something similar to what Milwaukee has? Maybe if if, if Vic is right there. So mm-hmm. that's that's a crucial point. That's a really key point, man. That's a key point. Vic accelerates so much, especially with the cap space, um, especially with the fact that 
I, I keep feeling like this isn't one of those years, like the K year, where we get the draft pick, you know, the first draft pick, and then Troy's like, okay, cool, we'll wait till the second. I right, man, I got a hunch. I just keep feeling like he, that, this man, no matter what happens, might find a way to get a second first-round pick in this draft. You're talking about bolstering your rebuild for the purposes of moving into this next phase. And one of the things he said is we need to be impervious to injury and we need to have depth. You know, aside from that, that kind of one tool that they don't have as it relates to the three and D wing. Uh, this was something that was very, very crucial to him. And so they can be very attractive to a coach. Uh, I, I think whether, you know, I thought it was very interesting that the Bucks fired Mike Budenholzer, moved on from him at this point. It's like, well, that's pretty savvy. Um, but everything that I liked about Willie Green, I started to, when you started talking about the age and the things, even just the stature mm-hmm. on the sidelines, I was mm-hmm. like, man, that's kind of Charles Lee. Under 40. You know, I know Jaron Collins is about to turn, I believe, 45. I think, uh, you know, it's about six or seven years between them. When you're talking about growing with a team, when you're talking about making a a the right hire, uh, a GM is not saying, you know what, I'm making my coach for right now hire. For mm-hmm. Weaver, that was kind of Casey, and he didn't hire him. It was just kind of, all right, let's just mellow this in. When you're making a coach, you're right. It's for the long haul. You want this to be a Popovich-type situation. Sometimes I, I think about this thing in a, in a um, going to work type situation where they had several coaches who were all good, but they all brought different things to the table. Yep. That team was a different team. It was built different. This is a young team that you have an opportunity to, to kind of create some type of foundation with that can be like a program for the next 20 years, like we saw with the Spurs. And you want that coach at the helm, especially with the things that the Pistons have been saying. We're not just building a team. It's a program from our pro team to our G League team to our front offices. It, it's, it's the same terminology. It's the same philosophy in terms of the types of players we want. You know, mm-hmm. to the point that we recognized uh, the you know, Luca Garza's of the world were able to come up and play those spot minutes in their rookie years, man. Get come in and start games and win and not skip a beat in that second half of the season when the Pistons were much better in cage rookie year. Those types of things were going on. You know, and, and I think that that type of stuff matters, man. It really does. Uh, uh, and and let, me, let me say this last thing, too. And I, I, th- I know we said it a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. What's critical in this is that you have three young black head coaching candidates who you haven't really heard their names yeah. mentioned. So this is not a bunch of um, good old boys and retreads that you're bringing names that you've heard and that you would typically yeah. hear. And we, we went through the nurse. We went through um, who did Houston hire? Um, who did Houston hire? The Rockets. Who did hire? Oh, M A M A Udoka. Yeah. So, so it's not. We're just going to take people with head coaching experience. This is Troy saying, "I'm going to find that next guy," which is important, I think, in the bigger scheme of things. That young black assistant coaches don't get the look every time, and now you see three up and coming guys, and they, they again. It could be none of these guys who end up getting hired, but at least they're the ones who are getting that first look at at this opportunity to do it. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that, man. Uh, If you got any more time, I wanted to ask you really quickly on this Jade and Ivy, Jalen Duran, they did make the second team, uh, all rookie second team. And honestly, I I was like, okay, all right, you guys are just trying to really disarm me. You're trying to disarm me. If Jalen Duran wasn't there and Jade and Ivy was on the second team, with Keegan Murray and Benedict Mathurin on the first. Oh, man, dude, I had something prepared. But they put Jalen Duran on there, and I think that it's just kind of a, a nod to, yes, we recognize these rookies were, were very good rookies, superior over a lot of the other rookies in this class. But the first team was effectively reserved for the ones that kind of started fast and kind of maintained. Whether they showed greater development after or not, there were rookies who kind of hit their mark and kind of maintained and were on winning teams or programs that were winning more. That's so I understand weird. it. I understand mm-hmm. it. I wanted to just ask you, did you believe that Jaden Ivey was snubbed at all? Is this just a situation where how the new metric of things go, this is not really a snubbing. This is just kind of how it is. Yeah, I don't think it's 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 very much of a snub. I was a little bit surprised that the, the, the gap, the margin between Matherin and um, and Ivy, and I, I think again, you've got to dig 
to find all of the stats and this and really watch some games and how many people really did watch Pistons games. So I'm not mad at it from that perspective. Um, and I think I tweeted, I'm more surprised that Duran was as solidly on the second team as he was. So that's the problem that I have with this is you, whoever was voting obviously looked at Duran's stats and dug a little bit deeper into that to say, He's very solidly, he's the second highest um, point total on the second team. And, and Ivy is the, the highest. So there was a gap between Ivy and Duran. But Duran, I want to say, what was the number? Like 80 something of the 100 votes. So people paid attention. They knew what was up with Jalen Duran. They just didn't kind of give that same sort of nod to Ivy over Matherin. And again, I'm not mad. I, I get it. I understand how, how the voting system works. Mm -hmm. But you would just hope that um, people really understand what kind of season he had and because Cade wasn't there. So if you're penalizing him because Cade wasn't there and he had to do a lot more, we've talked about the nuance of, hey, that ball handling is there. Those assist numbers are, are really, really high. That's what's up. But if you look at the, the the highest picks in that draft, big men, there weren't really guards that were there. Was was um was 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 Paolo gonna have more assists than him? No. Was Jabari Smith? No. Nobody really at the, the there wasn't a point guard at the high end of that draft who was going to be uh, have more assists than him. So that's the way you could explain that away and say, oh yeah, somebody had to lead in assists. So that's just what it was. Yeah. Yep. And, and I noticed. I think. Another thing that helps Jalen Duran is there were not a lot of narratives against Jalen Duran. With Jay yeah. and Ivy, there were narratives to support that didn't even have anything to do with him. People wanted to and put a lot of hope in and a lot of faith in what Benedict Mathen was going to be, Keegan Murray, and some of these other players that were drafted kind of around and ahead of Jay and Ivy. And I get that. There were a lot of questions that came out and a lot of people who, you know, when you put your your you know your take out there, you're going to kind of research things from that. So if I believe that Benedict Matherin is a guy and their stats are kind of marginally close and he has some wins. Well, yeah, I'm probably going to shade or hey, you know, ace this thing, shade this thing towards Benedict Matherin over Jay and Ivy. Yeah. But Jalen Duran, these narratives didn't really exist. He was a guy that many thought he's going to be the next. Like, look, bro, there was nobody who was saying that Jalen Duran was just going to be a scrub. It was just everyone was wondering. When is it going to happen? When, we, when is it, kick when is yeah. it going to take off? So it's like the narratives there was that he was already kind of this talent, this kind of, yo, he could be the next big thing. We just don't know when or what. And then what other bigs were there to realistically pit against him on the second team? You know, yeah. if we were talking about first team and he played the whole year, I think we'd be sitting here still seeing him snubbed if we didn't get the wins, but he put up similar stats. But so with Jalen Duran, yeah, and you got Paul George coming out on national platforms, multiple stars. So when Kay Cunningham was talked about, you didn't have people going on national platforms talking about Kay Cunningham. You don't have people going out on national platforms talking about Jay and Ivy. We know what player he is. We know mm -hmm. what Kay Cunningham was because we covered it. But Jalen Duran had people going on national platforms saying, no, nah, he's baby the white right now. No, nah, he got right. some skills right now. And I think that those things matter. So it, it does. It, it, it plays kind of into it. I was surprised I got it right. I'm going to say with Jalen Duran, not surprised at all with the Jade and Ivy thing. Um, you know, we've been kind of covering this now for the, the last year since Kay Cunningham was kind of snubbed that, you know, kind of expect this. This is the way of things now with the NBA. Uh, and I, I do thought I used to think it was a little weird when they used to give awards to a lot of players that were not in the playoffs when I was younger, <laughs> seeing them get awards like in a room. Sometimes it was like, hmm, all right, cool, because you want to honor those guys. But ultimately, you want to push for the winning. And I want to see what this team, what this team does next year for whoever they draft. Because that's something there. Cade, Ivy, and Duran are going to be like, bro, you know Whoever what? Whoever they draft. Whoever they draft for real. Come on. Are we doing this? <laughs> this is, what, this is how we're going to end it. This, look, look. This is where we're going to end it. Whoever they draft. ask you next. Your big board. I mean, no. There's two big boards here, guys. There's Rod's big board of reality, which <laughs> only has one name. <laughs> this is what we're going to who, Here's what who, I'm gonna do for you. Who are the five teams? Who are the four teams after the Pistons? Who are they picking? Let's do it that way. All right. So I'm gonna do one tankathon spin. One Let's legit rock. do that one. spin. Let's and let rock. me see. So 
Can I? Why are you getting my queued up? I'm gonna I'm share my big board. I'm gonna share my Woodward Pistons big board while you get that queued up. Okay. I like that. I, I like that. I, I forgot. We're supposed to have that tankathon. Rod's tankathon's present on this show during our draft season. So we're gonna kick it off today. My big board. All right. Obviously, I'm sick for Vic. Sick for Vic. Sick for Vic. Victor Wembanyama. Number two, Scoot Henderson. We're going to get into that on some later shows. Number three, Brandon Miller. Number four, and this one might be the controversy. I got the Thompson twins back to back, but I actually have a SAR at number four. And then I'm in Thompson at number five. All right. So you got it queued up here? Got it queued up. I sh- right. If I was on my laptop, I would be able to share my screen and this would be much easier. All right. All right. One spin. One spin. Let's go. Oh, number five. Number five. Number five. Number oh, five. Oh, oh, well. Oh. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> well, you know what I'm doing with the number five pick? I'm trading down. There we go. <laughs> trading that one. I'm trading down. Trading down. That was Doesn't gone. really like, matter. Who wants I'm not it? even messing around. I'm not even messing around with you. I, I, I'm, I'm trading down. Um, I mean, trading down to six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. I'll get Cam Whitmore and I'll be happy. And I just, like Cam Whitmore. That's what I was going to ask you. Is is Cam Whitmore somebody you reach for at five, or is he somebody you know will be there down in the draft? That athleticism. Did you see the picture? Did no. you see his, his, his – Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that looks Photoshopped the way that he was up. That's just – that's bananas. Woo. Look, so I, 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 I will take Cam Whitmore, and I will even take Chris Murray. If he's if you trade further down and you end up with Chris Murray, I am mad at it. I wouldn't be mad at that. I wouldn't be mad at that either. I, mean, I was going through some of these uh, prospects over the last three or four days just to kind of get a, a really, really good feel for it. And it's like, if you trade down, and that's why I said, man, I'm not going to be surprised if Troy says, let me get back into this draft. Not necessarily the lottery, but if he gets back into this first round, I'm not going to be surprised because of how kind of deep this draft is starting to look. There are stars kind of at the top, and usually a draft, they'll say, hey, who's at the top of the draft? Some of these drafts that are sneaky good are the ones where you have kind of these good players throughout. And that's what I'm kind of starting to see in this draft. A lot of skilled players, a lot of players who know how to play their role. And I, I think that this is one of those drafts that is uniquely like that. Last year's draft, I thought, was more, it, it was like ath- athletes and scores. I, this year's draft feels like it's more about skill set. And I like it. Like even Brandon Miller, look at a lot of the guys. People will say that they will they will try to ding a Scoot Henderson because they say, well, what role or skill set is he going to play? People, yeah. and I don't understand that. They're like, well, he's fast. He has his athleticism, but he can't shoot. I mean, have you seen his finishing at the rim? His finishing in traffic? Like, have you seen some of these things that are elite that Jay and Ivy came into the NBA? And I think Scoot Henderson might be a little bit better than Ivy at these same kind of similar traits. Jay and mm-hmm. Ivy came in with this speed and athleticism and did what? What he wanted to. Yeah, I like I I just I don't know, man. So so if last thing, yep. If you're hoping somebody wins the lottery that is not the Pistons, make it Portland. Because then that makes uh, Jeremy Grant that much more expendable, mm. and maybe even Matisse Thibel. If if those are the two that I like to see in um, them go after in free agency, the Pistons go after, and and kind of in that order, give me one of those two, and we can rock. I like that. I like that. I'm I'm bullish on Jeremy Grant. I know people say, oh, he's gonna want the bag. Did you see what he did? You see what, his stats? What, 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 what's, the, what's the most that you would give Jeremy Grant? Or what, what number would you feel uncomfortable giving Jeremy Grant? <sighs> 25 too much? No. 30 too no. much? You said 30? 30. No. 35? For me, no. Getting 35. up over that, we start to sweat. What's five, what's five mil? What's five mil more? And that's where I'm at. I'm like, the type of player he is, the type of production he brought, the way the defense cratered, bro, when he left, 
I, we're sitting well, here we, wondering if they even have a much meat on the bones. And then when he left, we were like, whoa. whoa. But we talked about it. We said it. What are you? What are they going to miss about Jeremy Grant? What's the first thing we, we said? Right after we were like, we're excited, you know, after the, the, the Jed and Duran thing. And we instantly, the next show was like, are we underestimating the loss of Jeremy Grant? Off our defense. 36% Off our defense. from three point. I, I was told he couldn't shoot here. He was 36% now last season. I don't know. I, I don't know. His catch and shoot was decent. I say put him in a position where his usage, not that you reduce his usage. Certain players, you keep the usage high. Put him in a position to where his usage is better utilized. He shouldn't be the point forward. Now you got K, actualized K. Now you have Jay and Ivy. Now you, you got, a better, you got a better roster around him now. He doesn't much need a better to. roster around him. If you, you don't, don't need him to develop in Portland. It's like it's a better roster around him. Right, you don't need him to put on a cape and come out and score 25 a night because now you've got Boyan, now you've got other pieces around him, you've got Cade, and he's got a whole roster who can do some of that stuff. And Duran, he's got a big, so it, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, that's all I got. That's all Ooh. I got. We're good. We're good. We're, we're on the same page. Ooh, man. We said it. This is our this is our season. This is our winning season. This is the part we said it in the beginning of the season. You guys are gonna be up and down all regular season, and then we're gonna get here, and then everyone's gonna realize, oh, this is what we were playing for the entire season. Yes, the cap space. Think about it. The losses are gone already. They're past. This is what's ahead of you: cap space, right? A, a draft pick, right? Six days. Six, Six days. days away. And Jaden Ivey, Jalen Duran, Kay Cunningham taking steps forward. Isaiah Stewart, if he develops any more, we're already saying he's a good piece. If he develops any more, he starts to teeter on really good piece. There's a lot to like here. And then I keep forgetting when we're talking about these things about Bojan Bogdanovic and Alec Burks. There's their stuff here, man. There's stuff here. And whatever Troy decides to do, I believe it's going to be good. If I work start soon, how many days away again? Six days away. Six days. Whew. Well, let me get this uh, housekeeping. If you got to go, I can drum roll you out. I'm just going to make sure I tell the people about Ashton's uh, three on three. Look, I need you guys to support because I want to be able to see everybody there. If you hoop, definitely sign up. Ashton's and Cannon Cunningham, uh, Cade's brother, Cade's cousin, Cade's trainer as well. They're throwing a three-on-three tournament and really a party for the city, man. Uh, you can find it on his page. Follow him at at, uh, at Ashton the Trainer, Ashton D A Trainer, uh, on Twitter, on IG. You'll find all the information there. Or follow us at What We're Pistons as well on IG and on Twitter, and you'll find the information there as well. It's going to be an awesome time. He did confirm that we got some local celebrities that will be in the building, and our What We're Pistons crew is going to be there as well. Sean Murphy's coming all the way from Grand Rapids. We want to take pictures. We want to say what's up. We want to hear your Pistons takes as well. We want to just uh, kind of be fan with the fan. Definitely. So we hope to see you guys out there. If you can, go there. Let them know that you guys are going to be coming through, whether you're playing or whether you're a spectator. And beyond that, um, definitely, y'all, we're going to start bringing this Cade zone back. On the next episode, we're going to talk about when Cade was drafted. And I want to talk about not has he met the expectations, but has he looked the part? So definitely, I appreciate you all for tuning in. We're going to get this thing drum rolled out of here. For Jeff I. Uh, Mr. Everything, man, definitely tap in with him. Say what's up to him. My name is Brandon Dent, a.k.a. Detroit Kool-Aid, and you've been rocking out with the Woodward Pistons podcast, and I need you guys to help me with this drum roll here. Rod brought the fire today. It was heat, and that shirt is fire too. And one more time for the Tigers. <laughs> Let's rock. Hey, yo, shout out to the legend, Detroit News, Rod Beard, brother. This was a good one, man. Any last words? No, that's it. Six more days. Six for Vic. Sick for Vic. Sick for Vic. No 